Sorry. My button was on mute. Good evening, everyone. Where do we want to start? Um, 416, B and C, I'm sitting here possibly figuring out what I did wrong, or I'm just doing it wrong in a whole new way. Well, um, most people get it wrong because they don't treat the characteristic of being white or Asian as a given, which yeah. is why I have it written here after the question in math speak to show you that this vague wording here in English in math speak becomes very clear that they're looking for the probability that somebody has type A blood given that they're white or for the next one, the probability that they have A or B blood given that they're Asian. So, so on C, okay. You start by adding up the entire Asian line, right? Yes. And, and that, that becomes, becomes your total. The total. Yes. And then you add up A and B and that's what you divide by. Hold on. My brain Asian A, B. So, so 2.2. So 2.2 divided by 4.2 is, will give me the answer, right? You, you got it. Perfect. Literally, literally sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Just yep. that's how it's done and then but then okay so but b i got 0.60 and you can tell me if i'm right and if i'm wrong then i think i just need to do the opposite of what i did so um let's see b b should be Okay, so what I do is I add up. Yes, 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 yes. B is B is. I've got 0. 0.599, which will be 0. 0.60. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Woo woo. Well done. Well, I got the strangest ones right, and then and then the stuff that really shouldn't have been that difficult wrong. Okay. That's pretty typical. Students overthink these a lot. Oh That's, God. You know, I, I said in the very beginning that probability is the one place where students have the most difficulty. And it's not because probability is difficult. It's because probability is too easy. And they overthink <laughs> it. it really and is I, the truth. I love this one on 421. <laughs> when I sent you my, my test, are there events where white and whatever T1 is are independent? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm thinking like in the world. <laughs> right, instead of what it means to be independent in, in probability. <laughs> so for for four to one c uh, so for the first one a donor has type of blood given that they are white is that how we say that for part b yes I, i'm sorry or for a for for four to one a yes okay that's what i thought and then c okay so c are they independent i said no they're not independent because being white and having typo blood, I put impact each other. I think I'm saying that wrong. Well, that's not what it means to be independent. <laughs> what it means to be independent is that one thing does not change the probability of the other. So uh, what that means is mm -mm. having type O blood would remain the same probability whether you made somebody Caucasian or not. So that, that extra characteristic of being white, if, if it had no bearing, if it had no influence over type O blood, then the probability of being type O across the entire population versus the probability of being type O when you're Caucasian or white would be exactly the same. If they're different, then that means there's some sort of dependence, meaning that being Caucasian has an influence on whether or not you are type O blood. And if you look at the probabilities from the table, I mean, you just calculated in part B, the probability of having type O blood given that you're white. Yes. Well, if we look at the probability of just having type O blood, then we would add up this column, this right? Col uh -huh, right. This first column, 
right and then basically divide by one but it gives us a total probability of a little over 46 percent, 46.2 percent so 46.2 percent right. of the population is type o blood then if you ask the, the question well what's the probability that you're typo given that you're white well then it's 36 divided by you know all of the the white ones put together yeah and that does not equal 46.2 uh, and because those two numbers are different that means those two characteristics are no longer independent okay so they're oh so they're not independent that part at least was correct yeah. but they're and, not independent because the probability of each is different correct and this is true in the real world every race has a different distribution of blood types. So blood type and race are not independent. The race that you um, are influences your chances of having different blood types. Yeah. Just like gender and prostate cancer are not independent because yeah. males get prostate cancer at much greater um, likelihood than females. So okay. your, your gender and, and prostate cancer are not independent. Mm -hmm. It's those kinds of things. Got it. So then for D, are the events white and, hang on, T1. Having type O blood. Type O blood mutually exclusive no i put no because both can be true at the same time in this Which is, case. yes so mutually exclusive is exactly what you think and and you are com absolutely correct mutually okay. exclusive means that they cannot occur at the same time so if they were mutually exclusive then that would mean no whites would have typo blood right right if we, if we looked at the intersection of being white and having typo blood that probability would have to be zero and we can see very clearly from the table that it is not it is 36 percent. yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah got that okay fabulous okay if if anyone needs 4.23 miraculously i got that one right <laughs> All right, Emily, I see you're off mute. Do you have a question? No, um, I think you covered it with Catherine. Thanks. Okay. Mary, I see you're off mute. You have a question? Um, no. Well, I sent you about four questions. So okay. I know one of them was 4.26. Um, yeah, let me uh, bring it up. Okay. Just uh, read to me what like 4.26B, read to me what P and then in parentheses A, and what's the slash called? That's given. Given, okay. So A given B. Yeah, so ah, the, okay. the, this right here says, what's the probability that A occurs given that B has already occurred? That's, so okay. In the case of the context of this question, it's asking, What's the probability that an employee works at the high level capacity level, given that the employee falls into the highest <laughs> extensive formal training category? Okay. So the given always becomes our new total. So instead of looking at the entire table, we're now only going to look at the green. We're only going to look at this column of data because that's, that's what B is. It's, it's everybody who falls in, excuse me, into the extensive training um, okay. Stuff. And now within that small subset, right? So within that 36% of the population of employees, so within this subset, what is the probability that they are also an employee that works at higher capacity, i.e. we're looking at the intersection of blue and green, which is 0.22. So 0.22 becomes the good out of this total because it's the only thing that is in blue that is also in the subset of green because again we're only looking at the new subset the given subset of b so the answer is literally just as simple as 0.22 
over 0.36 and then you figure out what that is as a as a percentage okay <clears throat> well, so the yeah. next one uh-huh so it would say what's the probability mm -hmm. of b given that b is the total you talking about this one right here uh 4.26 b part the second part yeah so this is what's the probability that we have right. B given that we don't have B because B with a line over it is the complement of B. So this is basically asking what's the probability that an employee falls into the highest extensive formal training category given that our employee does not fall into the highest extensive training program. Okay. And it's, it's zero. It's impossible. Okay. Okay. That's okay. So trick question. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. The same because as the next one. You can't work at high capacity and low capacity. Correct. There is no, you can see from the, from the coloring up here, there's absolutely no intersection between yellow and green. Okay. So if we're told that we're given C, that means we're living in this subset and we're only concerned with things in the yellow subset. And within that subset, what is the probability that they are also right in? Right. Well, be careful. We're not asking for them to be in B. We're asking them to be in not B. B. See the line over it? Okay. So it's given that we're living in this subset, what's the probability that we're, that we're also not in the green stuff? Well, isn't all of this stuff not in the green stuff? Right? Isn't all right, of the yellow? Right, right. Yeah. Right. So all of the yellow becomes good and all of the yellow was already our total because it was our, our given condition. And therefore, it's a probability of one. Because really, not B is asking the question A, A or C. So it's basically saying, what's the probability that somebody either works at the high level or has little or no, formal, no, little or no formal training, given that they have little or no formal training? You go, okay, well, this is my subset. What's the pro pro probability that they're either in the yellow or in the blue? Well, this is the only good that's still in my subset. So I count those all up and that's the entire subset. So it's just that over that it's one. I did not have the compliment sign over mine when I downloaded these. There you so go. that really messed me up. Yeah. That changes things. Yeah. Okay. Dr. McBride, can we do C? Um, on this one? Yes. Sure. So A um, union B. Okay. Right? I have, I got like, is it the probability of A plus B? Yeah. You just take okay. all of and the blue mine, okay. and add all the green, but don't add 0.22 twice. Okay. So you do A plus B and then you do you minus the probability of the intersection of the A and B? Well, only if when you calculated the probability of A and the probability of B, you added, you know, all of these. So if you if you did the probability of A as these four numbers together, and then you did the probability of B as these three numbers together, and you added those all together, then yes, you would have to subtract 22 because you've added it twice. Okay. It's much easier to just do it directly and go, well, if I'm looking at A or B, that's asking a very simple question of, are they in blue or are they in green or are they in both, right? Those are all of my quote unquote good. So I just add 10, 15, 16, 22, the other 10 and four, put those all together. Those are my good. And then okay. of course my total is a hundred. So, you know. Once I have my good, I'm done. Okay. And then A intersect C is asking for the probability that they are both simultaneously at the same time in A and C. So we're looking for the intersection of the blue stuff and the yellow stuff. Well, is there any intersection between those two? Nope. So no. the probability is zero. Oh, okay. 
And then the same with the last one. We're looking for where B and C overlap. Well, B is the green, C is the yellow, and those two don't overlap at all. They are mutually exclusive. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Tiffany, are you good? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, thank you. Of course. Okay, well, I guess I might as well just move on and say, are there any questions on 441? Okay. I'm good. I'm. How about 446? So 4.46a is 0.85 to the 20th power. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then the, that is the same as true for 4.46 D only is 15. Um, it, mm, there's two ways to interpret it. That is a valid way. I personally think there's a more accurate way to interpret it. And again, it goes back to what I've said before. The problem with probability questions is when you ask things in English. Because unless you're very precise with your words, it is very easy to interpret what you're actually asking mathematically in more than one way. So let's, you know, let's parse out what exactly does it mean that none of the 20 return products has any sort of defect? Well, as you've pointed out, 15% have no problems. So <clears throat> to say that none of the 20 return products has any sort of defect, you can kind of do it. You can think of it as two ways. You can think of it as, well, out of my sample of 20, none of them, zero of them, will come back as not having any defect. So then that would be a binomial distribution where your number of successes is zero, your sample size is 20, and then your probability of a success is the 15. That will actually give you quite a different answer than if you interpret it kind of the way you said, and a lot of people interpret this way, as if none of the 20 has any sort of defect, then that means that all of them have some sort of defect, right? Right. It's, it's so then you could hmm. re do it differently that way. The book says that you're supposed to basically do um, your idea of 15% raise the 20. Same as how you did 0.85 raised right. to 20 in the first one. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I, I technically think the most accurate way to do it is to do a binomial with zero as your number of successes and your probability of success being 0.15. But, you know. Like I said, it's it's vague enough that I would suggest I would. There are really like three different ways you could you could argue this one, and I would accept any of them. Okay, now on. <clears throat> so four point four six B I put into my SAS. Mm -hmm. So four point four six C, because the SAS formula only says, um, only goes down. Yes. I have to take the complement of that. Correct. Okay. Okay. That's what and I what did. is okay. the complement of six or more? Uh, I put the return products were seven because it had to be more than six. It has to be a whole number. Right. But if you're looking for the complement of six or more, right? So you're trying to find the probability that six or more are defective and not functioning. But like you said, we can't do that in SAS because SAS only does less than stuff. So I put less than seven. Nope. Because that you counts. The that probability counts. of less than seven. That That's counts. Five. That counts six. Is it five? Yes, five. it's five. Very good. 
less than five. Nope. It's just, you have to do a CDF of five. Oh, okay. Because that counts up zero okay. through five. Okay. And then if you take one minus that, it gives you six and above. Okay. <clears throat> so is the answer 0.97? It is. Well, it's okay. technically 0.98 because it's 9793. Oh, okay. So if you want but to when I to when I when I um ran it, it gave me 0 0.9793. Is okay, that, right. is that okay? Yeah. yeah, but if that's true, wouldn't it round to 0.98? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I got it. And Dr. M for yes. uh, for 4.46D, um, I got an answer that uh, I basically had a decimal point with 16 zeros, then 333 is that. That is, <laughs> yes, that is, that is what happens when you run it one way. You get something that's basically zero. Yes. And that's totally okay. fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, if you run it the other way, the, the way that I was talking about with, um, the zero out of 20 and a, and a probability of 15, you actually get 0 0.03876. So you get almost 4%. So it's a huge difference. And that's, that's what I you mm -hmm. know, keep talking about is words matter because depending on how you interpret that question, you get two vastly different answers. Okay. All right. I did not. Oh. Sounds right. Sorry, I was going to say that kind of sounds close to the answer to 446A, which I don't know if you actually stated it earlier, but I got 0.0388 on that yes. one. Yes, yeah. me too. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And they should be very similar because, um, you know, if all of the 20 have some type of problem, isn't that the same thing as none of them having any sort of defect? Oh my gosh. I'm muting myself. I mean, isn't it? I mean, think about it. If all of them have a problem, then that means none of them were perfect. That's correct. So none of them has any sort of defect is the same thing as all of them having some type of problem. Okay. So that that's what I mean by it's, it just depends on, on how you interpret it. Fantastic. And and throughout this assignment. Michael, you 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 went out after this assignment. Yeah, Mike, you're um there's something wrong with your audio. You might want to try logging out and logging back in. Okay, so are we going to go over 4.51? I am sorry, I did not have time to get to that. That is my task for tomorrow, that's, that's but we can go over it. That's great. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Yeah, Mike, you're back. Go ahead. What were you saying? Okay, fantastic. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> God damn it. No, it doesn't work again. <laughs> Right. Mike, log out and back in. I'm going to kick your ass out of here if I could. I was saying. <laughs> Did I go out again? Yes. Log out and log back in, damn it. <laughs> we'll, when you come back in, we'll answer your question. <laughs> While he's doing that, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Back on part C, is that where you do one minus the answer that SAS gives you? Yes, because you would do um, a CDF of five, and then you would do one minus that. And what was the answer again? I'm sorry. For C? Yeah. What was it? Um, Nine, 0.9793. There you go. Yep, 0.9793, which rounds to 0.98, oh. whichever way you want to write it. Thank you. I've yep. got to check my work again. I got something really off. <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, I, it's it's I got, just make sure that in the code you've got all the right numbers in the right places. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I, I wrote it as 97.9 percent. That's right. That's totally perfect. That's the exact same thing. And I should know that. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Catherine, you're still off mute. Do you have another question? Uh, no, just four five one and 
I assume that's where we're headed next. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I assume we're done with 46 since we've gone over all of them. All right. So let's but, move on. Yeah. 451. Um, so what is the probability that the firm will have more than five sales in a randomly selected day? Well, first of all, if we look at the context of the question, right, they've got... They estimate that one of every 1,000 internet hits results in a sale. And then they say, suppose the firm has 2,500 hits per day. What is the probability the firm will have more than five sales in a randomly selected day? So what kind of distribution is this? Oh, it's a time interval. No. You mean like the po poise? Not the well, poison. It's got to be one of the two because we've only learned two. It's either well, binomial or poison. So which one? It's binomial? poison. Nope, oh. it's binomial. Good job, on it. or Steve, Oof. whoever said that. Um, yeah, it's binomial. Now, the reason why you thought it was poison is because it talks about time. Time, but, right. But it doesn't talk about a number of hit. It doesn't talk about a number of sales over a span of time. It talks about a number of sales over a number of sales, right? It says it gets it gets one sale for every 1,000 hits. So that's a number of things out of a number of trials. And then it says, suppose it has 2,500 hits. Again, that's a number of things, not a span of time. You're thinking that all of this is maybe happening in a day, but, you know, because they tell you it happens 25 hits per day. But we're not, we're not measuring something over 25 or 24 hours, we're measuring something over 2,500 hits. So it's still a binomial. Wait, Dr. McBride, so per day is not time? Well, if, if the question was per day, then yes, it would be time and we would use the Poisson approximation. But in the given context of the question, it's a binomial because they gave us a set number of trials, 2,500. And out of those 2,500 trials, they want us to figure out how many successes we have. They didn't say, they didn't say over a day. I mean, they did say in a randomly selected day, but we know how many hits there are in a day. So they're really not asking us to compute something over a time period. They're asking us to compute something out of a number of trials. Okay. All right. Is this a PDF or a CDF? I'm trying to figure those two out. Well, they want more than five sales. They don't want exactly five sales. Okay. So, so it's a CDF. Yeah. And if they want more than five sales, we have to do a... less than because exactly the complement. So okay. So it's going to be one minus the CDF of what number? Okay. So N is going to be, they want 5,000. No, n is going to n is the number of uh, samples, so that's twenty five hundred. Okay, let's see. But for here, what's our x? What's our number of successes for our CDF? Anybody? Well, we want five. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you're going to run a CDF on five, with your sample size being twenty five hundred. And your probability of a success being one out of a thousand, which is, you know, 0. 0.0001. Okay. And then one minus whatever we get in that answer. Okay. Yep. Whew. All right. That helps a lot. What are I'm the conditions? I'm not sure I would have gotten that binomial. What are the conditions okay. that we have to have in order for this to be a binomial? Um, That's part B. Anybody? Uh, don't think you know that hits have to remain constant as one. I the prob well, yes, no. the probability of a sale has to remain constant. Okay. Yes. Very good. You, you need to have a known number of trials and a known P of success. Yes, very good. But in, in generality, there are only two things we need for a binomial. The probability of a success has to stay constant. So in this case, the probability of a sale remains constant. And the trials are all independent. So in this case, oh, yeah. the internet hits are independent. Okay, that's right. 
So okay. always, always, always think of a binomial and always remember a binomial as being a fancy coin flip. Because if you flip a coin, the probability of a success is always the same. It's 50%, whether your success is heads or tails, right? But even if it was a, a weighted coin and heads came up 70% and tails came up 30%, it would still, the probability would still be the same every time you flip that coin. So the probability of a success remains the same every time you flip the coin. And every time you flip the coin, the outcome is completely independent of what happened the last time you flipped the coin because the coin doesn't have a memory. It's just reset every time. And so those are the two things we have to have to be a binomial. Right on. And, and for part A, are we looking at uh, 0 0.042? Yes. All right. Excellent. And, and, and Dr. M, there was one, I, for all of these, I've been putting them in as a number, what I was trying to say before, you know, zero through one as probability. Uh, but there was one question that asked for proportion. I think it was 441C. And I put that as a percent. I mean, is that correct? Or will that get dinged? Oh, yeah. Because they say no, what proportion of customers. To, it's yeah. all the same. It's all the same. Percentages yeah. and decimals are all the same. And, and, and probabilities okay. are often reported as percentages. So it's totally fine okay. to report a probability as a percentage. Okay. So it's kind of our uh, student's choice then in that case? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, I'm thanks. smart enough that I can look at a percent and know if it matches my answer <laughs> key or not. Okay, guys, didn't didn't want any of us to get hit on a technicality. Yeah, no, not I'm not that big of a dick. <laughs> not not okay, at all. No, no. So four point five one C using the poison approximation. Yep. So that's what we just found. But now, do we have to do it in a different way? Use the poison prob probability on this one? Yes. Okay. All right. And then how do I know if it's yes or no? Because does it match what really happened with my binomial? Yeah, I mean, basically, okay, if, if, okay. when it asks if it's accurate or not, it's just if those two answers are similar. I mean, they, And they, for they... the poison, it's also a CDF. Yes. Okay, all right. You just have to figure out what your, what your mean okay. is. Because mm -hmm. poisons use means, right? You have to have an average. Okay. <clears throat> And I used Excel in mine and I got the same thing. Yeah, you should. They're, they're yeah. almost identical. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yep. So oh. the average, all right, I'm looking at this again. This, the average, <clears throat> probably from a five sales and Ram selected day. Okay, I'll have to get my book and read it, I guess, or listen again. Because well, I... in order to use the Poisson, right? So if we go right, if we go to our, our code here and we bring up probabilities, we'll see that down here for um, right the Poisson, we need to know the mean and then the value of interest. So instead of you know, in the binomial we have an X and an N where X is the number of successes and then N is our sample size and then P is our probability of success. For a uh, Poisson, we only have two things. We have X, the same thing as before, basically the number of successes, but instead of a sample size and a probability, we have a mean. Well, who can tell me how to calculate the mean of a binomial distribution? Is it N times P? Nice job, Lonnie. Perfect. And that is what we use in the Poisson. We simply okay. just take N times P, which gives us the mean of our binomial distribution. And we use that for the mean of our Poisson. Because then that comes back and says, okay, in this given time interval of 24 hours, on average, we would see four successes. Okay. And so then from there we go, okay, then what's the probability of getting, you know, blank or, you know, whatever the number was for the mean. In this case, it's 2.5 successes. <clears throat> All 
All right. So that's it. That's the homework. Okay. Any questions on the final project for those of you that have actually started working on it? nothing but crickets that's that's my project that's, for this weekend that's right <laughs> okay let me give you guys some hints and some tips for when you start working on this okay first and foremost number one the thing that people screw up is they don't realize that you are supposed to create a histogram and the mean and standard deviation for all three of the probability distributions that you have in your Excel file. So in this Excel file, um, for this first set of data, the, what do they call it? The new Walt data or whatever, I think. Yeah, the new, new Welt data. There are uh, three categories of data. There are three, um, basically, um, probability distributions. There is something that shows the probability of the number of freights that um, were purchased, and, and that has to do with kind of the cost of sailing on the ship. Then there's another set of data that lists um, the probability of, I think it's the number of families per parish. And then there's a third one that has the probability distribution of just how many people are in each family. It's called family members. So the number of, of family members in a family. So you have three sets of data. You have three probability distributions. And remember, we've talked about discrete probability distribution before. All these are is a bunch of numbers and then the probabilities that they show up, right? So there'll be zero, it'll have a probability. One, it'll have a probability. Two, and so on and so forth. Now the, the freights one is slightly different because you can buy a half of a freight. So in that one, you'll see decimals, you know, like there'll be one with a probability, one and a half with a probability, two with a probability, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, so for question one, you're basically running um, a mean and standard deviation on all three of those distributions. And then you're also doing a histogram. It's really a bar chart, but a histogram on all three of those things. Um, so that's the one sticking point there. The next two are pretty basic. Number four is extremely compl complex. So um, give it a shot, but I guarantee you will not be anywhere close to what you need to do because uh, it's, it's a very complex question. It's a, it's a two-parter. The first thing you have to do is you have to figure out the probability that a family would actually purchase more than four freights and that's easy because all you got to do is add up the probabilities of either five or six freights from the data from question one. And then that gives you that probability. Once you have that probability, then you have to run a binomial CDF with a sample size of six, the probability that you got from the stuff that you added together, and then a number of successes is four. And then you do one minus that because this question wants to know the probability that there was more than four freights out of six. And then that will give you the final answer. So that one's a little tricky. Make sure that you spend some time thinking about that. And I'm sure we'll talk about it again later. In part two, the thing that people screw up or forget is that um, you have to calculate the probability of an appeal, the probability of a reversal, and the probability of a reversal given an appeal for every single judge in all three courts and for the totals in all three courts. So for instance, let me uh, show you what I mean with the data. One of these days I'll buy a new computer that doesn't take six hours to load Excel. Woo, 14%. Woo, 100. Woo, back to zero. Hmm. Feels like it takes forever. 
Oh, back to zero again. Holy crap. All right. Maybe I have something else I can open. Oh, there we go. Jeez, me, Christmas. All right. So file part two. Okay, so here's the data that you have for, for this part. And you have three different courts. They, this is not broken up into three different courts. You'll see that there's common pleas is one court and then domestic relations and then municipal. The way you're gonna see your data is it's gonna be in three different tabs. So tab one is gonna be the common pleas court and it's gonna list all these judges and then below the judges it's gonna have a total. So it's gonna have total number of cases um, seen, total number of appeals, total number of reversals. So when you're calculating these things, which this first one is probability of appeal, probability of reversal, and then the conditional probability of reversal given appeal. Not only do you have to do it for all the judges, but you also have to do it for the total that's at the bottom. And then you go to the next tab and you do it for these four judges and then the total that's at the bottom. Then you go to the next tab and you do it for these 20 judges and then the total that's at the bottom. So that's the first thing people uh, mess up or don't realize. Then you have to go back and you have to rank all of your judges um, within each individual court and then you also have to rank them overall now you'll notice that um, some of the judges are listed twice because some of the judges work in multiple courts there's only two of them so this judge works in both this court and this court and then of course this judge here works in this court and that court so you have to decide all right am i going to judge this judge when I'm doing the rankings by court, it's pretty obvious because I just, you know, I treat three and four from just what they're doing in this court. But when I go to rank everybody overall, what are you going to do with these things, right? You got to figure out what you would need to do with judge three and judge four and basically justify your decisions. Um, so that's that one. Oh, here it is. I should have just done it. I should have just... Uh showed it on i think it's on here final project oh no it's not oh okay never mind then the uh, third part of the final project um i gave you some guidance on this early on the idea is to create your own scenario that will result in you gathering data that lives on a continuous probability distribution, not a discrete like we're doing now, but a continuous that we will be doing next week. So that means you need to gather data that is measured. Remember, we've talked about this. Discrete data comes from counts and continuous data comes from measures so things like you know your height and your weight are measures your age is a measure you know all, all those kind of things so hopefully there is some variable some set of data that is related to your dissertation topic that would be continuous and if that's the case then please use that as your scenario and basically start thinking about how you would gather this data that you're going to need for your dissertation and do all of this based on, on that. If however, your dissertation, at least in its current incarnation in your mind, or if you've started working on it or whatever, doesn't contain any continuous data, then just make the whole damn thing up. Come up with any scenario that would require you to gather measurable data, right? Measurements, and then use that scenario to define and answer all of these questions. And then when you get to part six, based on this scenario and based on the, um, the fictitious, you know, variable and data that you would have, 
you are to create these five or oh, sorry, these four questions. And again, these are completely made up. So let me give you an example. Let's say your variable was people's weight. Then this first one could be, you could simply ask the question, pick a person at random, what's the probability that they are over 150 pounds? The second one would be pick a person at random, what's the probability that they're less than 200 pounds? And the third one could be, what's the probability that they're in between 175 and 250? And then the fourth one would be, what percentage of your data is above 300 or below 75 or in between something and something, right? So the percentile question is just kind of asking the same thing, but in a different, in a different context. So that's what I mean by these. You're just, you're, you're literally making everything up. You're making up the, the numbers and everything. And then um, you, you, you don't, you, you don't have to get results because obviously you don't have data. If you have data, great, you can run it. But if you don't have data, then don't worry. The graphs to visualize your solution, those are supposed to be uh, normal curves. So you're supposed to have a nice little bell curve and we'll see examples of this next week. And when you um, do probabilities, the bell curve gets uh, colored in. So I can actually show you a great example online of this. And you can just use technology to create these or um, you can draw them by hand if you don't wanna try and figure out how to do them in technology. Cause there are places on the internet where you can find, the, where you can get them to make, create these bell curves for you. I'm doing it in a thing called stack crunch, which you need, um, you need, you need to pay for this. I get it free as an instructor, but most people have to pay for it. So let's say, you were doing weights, right? And in our sample, the uh, average weight was 195 and the uh, standard deviation was 12 pounds. And we asked the question, what's the probability that somebody is greater than 225? There's the graph, there's the shaded in region, right? If we did uh, 210, there we go, same thing, right? If we did less than 210, there it is. And then if we click up here on between, we can do in between, uh, you know, like 185 and 200. Bam, there's the picture. Okay. And then for percentiles, you just go backwards. So what a percentile does is instead of asking what's the percentage given a number, you say, what's the number given a percentage? So I want to say, um, you know, um, What's the, uh, how heavy is some, um, what's the cutoff to be in the upper 10%, right? So if we're in the upper 10%, we wanna be um, greater than 0.9. There we go. Nope, that's not right. We wanna be greater than 0.1, duh. We want everything above this number to only be 10%. So there we go. If you're 210 pounds, you're in the top 10%, you know, the 90th percentile, that kind of thing. So th those are those would be the question type of questions. Those would be the types of graphs you'd want to generate for them. Um, and that's it. That's the final project. It's pretty cut and dry. Okay. So um, any remaining questions before we go? <clears throat> No, sir. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Dr. M. Yes. Hey, uh, one back on the homework. Yeah. Sorry. It was on, um, I think it was, uh, it was, it was way back on 4.21 4, 4 uh, B. It was, there were two, it, it said the event T, then it had the bar and I copied it and then W and then it put P, T1 bar W. Yeah, this one. That's just one question, or are we computing two things? I got 0.449 on that one. There's one thing. Um, basically, I just wrote this to show you that that's what they meant by all of this English. So okay. these, this is one question written in English and written in, in math speak. 
okay so it's just asking for one answer and, yes yeah uh and am i on the right track 0.449 um that, i think so that sounds right that, anyone remember that one out there uh, <laughs> okay 21 i got 0.4489 so it's yeah. pretty close oh Which okay rounds, cool. yeah rounds to 0.449 yep okay great great i uh appreciate that verification no problem and um yeah wonderful i think that was the only last thing i had thank you okay guys thanks for showing up we'll see you next week thank you have a good weekend thanks you too thank you good night thank everyone. you good night doctor